castles dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Today, most are decaying relics, many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. The origin of our castles is distinctly French, introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman conquest of 1066. Three, two, one, Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch, using the same tools, techniques, and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface, because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter, and Tom will experience the daily rigors of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. And everyday life. Really good, you know. How workers dressed. Oh. And ate. You can really smell your food. <laughs> and the art of combat. Oh. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. It's May, and the team have been immersed in the building works alongside Gedelon's masons. They've learned how the castle was defended in times of war. Every stone has to be in line, because this is going to go up and up and up. Now the team discover the surprisingly colorful world of 13th century castle interiors. And much of the material they work with will come straight from the ground. Some of the stuff in here is ochre. From paint to brighten the rooms. It's hot. Look at the difference on my fingers. To turning mud into floor tiles. Can you imagine living in a world with no electric lights? And they'll be rediscovering an ancient art in a midnight firing at the kiln. The medieval castles we're used to seeing today are scarred by centuries of warfare and weather erosion. Most of their original roofs, carpentry, and interior finishes have long since disappeared. But these drab walls are a far cry from how they looked in their heyday. This is how many of us think of the interior of castles. Bare stone, echoey, damp, gritty underfoot, but that's because we're used to ruins. When they were in use back in the 13th century, they were rather different. You have to imagine tiled floors and plaster on the walls, perhaps painted, whitewashed, and then hangings of fabric over the top, filled with furniture. And that, too, is covered in fabrics, cushions, all sorts. An entirely different beast. To strive for accuracy, the Gedelon project has adopted a specific historical time frame to work to. The castle is being designed and built as it would have been in the France of the 1230s and 40s, during the reign of King Louis IX. The region of Puisé in Burgundy was governed by one Jean de Toussy, a vassal to the king. 
In turn, de Toussy was the overlord of several other lower-ranking noblemen. And it was one of these lesser nobles who would have commissioned a castle like the one being built here at Gedelon today. It's not a grand royal castle, bristling with military might and enormous wealth, but a fortified residence of relatively modest taste and design, according to the rank and means of the imaginary lord of Gedelon. The team, along with site administrator Sarah Preston, are exploring some of the key rooms and quarters within the castle to find out how the interiors are being dressed. This is the castle's great hall. Great is the word. So this is very much the, the hub of castle life. This is, it's a dining hall, it's a, it's a banqueting, feasting hall. I mean, this room is a statement of power and prestige, isn't it? Absolutely, which is why it's important to bear in mind, of course, once it's finished, we won't have these bare stone walls. The Great Hall was the political and business hub of castle life. This was where the Lord held court, receiving his tenants and listening to their concerns and grievances. With many of the social rituals of the day being held here, it was important for the interior design to show off his wealth and status to invited guests. Over the next few years, the Great Hall at Gedelon and the Great Tower adjacent to it will be dressed in the style of a 13th century lord and his lady. So this is currently the Lord's chamber. This is where the Lord would sleep with his wife and his children. It's certainly a residential chamber. You can see that from the fireplace on the wall behind us. So it can be heated. That's not true of all the rooms <laughs> in the castle. The stone walls are rough, uneven and drafty. But they would have been dressed and painted. Peter and Tom are going to be painting and tiling some of the castle's indoor spaces while Ruth makes paint. So this is the story. Um, but first, the story Sarah takes her to the already decorated kitchen under the Great Hall. Story, but eventually it will have a render applied and then a lime wash to make it much whiter and brighter. Come and have a look. Oh, I see what you mean. I mean, that's real darkness into light, isn't it? It makes such a difference. People aren't used to necessarily seeing the inside of castle walls rendered and lime washed, but it's made such a difference to the people who actually work in the kitchen because it's it like... It seems sort of bounce off, doesn't it? Turning on an electric light, absolutely. And I guess in terms of hygiene, it would have made a difference oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, definitely, really. It sort of kills anything that might be there and stops bugs getting mm. into all the cracks and things. So you start with a really sterile surface, repaint it if you don't, whenever you need to. I mean, Obviously, so far, we haven't had the time to render the inside of all the rooms. We've got other priorities at the moment, but as soon as we've finished kind of the major building work, then we can get on with the job of rendering the inside, but I hope also the outside of the castle, because often the outsides of castles were also rendered and lime washed, because in terms of visibility, it just meant that your castle stood out in the landscape. So that's something that we couldn't necessarily get away with in a genuine historic monument, but here on this experimental site, that's something that we can show our visitors. Uh, the Tower of London, the White Tower, was named because it was lime washed on the outside. The tower nearest the quarry, known as the Quarry Tower, would have been a guard room or shooting gallery. Even this would have been brightly decorated. The boys have been tasked by stonemason Fabrice Mango with rendering the interior wall with lime mortar, the medieval equivalent of plaster. We're going to use two and a half buckets of sand and one lime and water and mix it in. What we're looking for here is the right consistency. Keep on adding a little moisture. Turn it in, turn it in. A bit more. It's OK. Are you happy? Is that good enough? It's good. Yeah. Cozy workspace. Fabrice demonstrates how a medieval wall is rendered. Put some water. 
We're not drenching it though, are we? It's dampening this time. If you don't put water, mortar, uh, just, it just won't stick. The... Right. Okay. Archaeological research has revealed that rendering wouldn't have been applied in several smooth layers, but with a single rough coat, using a technique similar to spreading butter. Interesting technique, isn't it? Keeping the board close to the wall, pushing the render up. Shall we go first? You want yeah, to try it? give it a go. <laughs> Let me get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to learn from your mistakes, my friend. <laughs> um, so to do a turret like this, how long do you think it would take? Two, three days. Two, three days. That's ten it. days for, for you, Tom. Two, Mason. <laughs> At least ten days for me. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need it. See you later. As the lime mortar is relatively porous, it will draw out any dampness in the wall and so help to preserve the masonry underneath. It's interesting, isn't it, that we're only putting on one coat, that butter coat. But this is an established practice, isn't it? You always think when you go to the ruined castles in the UK or around Europe, these bare walls are what they were looking at. However, not the case. It was a prestige thing to get a layer of render up, decorate it. Yeah, I mean, castles, uh, majority of castles, they are just ruins, aren't they? You're coming to them very long after their lives. The medieval manufacture of tiles for castle roofs and floor spaces was an industry in itself. So far, at Gedelon, 28,000 tiles have been created for the roof of the Great Hall building alone, a job which took four years to achieve. It's estimated that a total of 80,000 tiles will be needed to cover the roofs of the castle in its entirety. But as the four towers around the curtain wall are still under construction, tile production has now shifted from roof tiles to floor tiles. And Tom is about to discover just how laborious the process is to make just one tile. It's breaking up some of this clay. We're going to use it for our tiles. Obviously not in this state. We actually need to get a lot of these impurities out. But some of the stuff in here is ochre. And ochre can actually be turned into paint. So I'm going to separate some of that out. But for now, just stack up on this clay, get it back to the tuilery or the tile makers. In the 11th century, many hamlets and villages in France specialised in tile production to meet increasing demand from the local nobility. And as the medieval tile trade grew, so did the strict regulations it was governed by, designed to standardise production. Oh, that's the thing about clay, isn't it? It's not easy to work. You can feel all the muscles getting involved. So you take some there. In 1280, a decree from Toulouse stipulated that good tiles may only be made from well-pugged clay well trampled underfoot and not over dry. It feels nice, though. Is this good for the hands, good for the skin? Very nice for the skin, yeah. Some people are paying for this. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky us. <laughs> I've always wanted soft hands. Tom and tile maker Emmerich Guillot are now removing any twigs and stones and making the clay homogenous and malleable. Ah, so this hard lump here, this could be ochre. Yes. The ochre pigments contain colourful iron oxides and are set aside to be used for making paint. An integral feature of castle design were the toilets. They were known as garde-robe, the French word for wardrobe. Clothes would often be kept inside them because it was believed the smell of ammonia from urine kept parasites at bay. Garderobe were often built out of the castle walls to allow the waste to drop down through the hole 
to the ground or moat below. Gedelon keeps a wooden grill over the holes to dissuade any modern-day visitors from attempting to spend a penny. It's a big question, isn't it, how people use guard ropes? There is little bits of evidence in the earliest of the manners books, which are aimed at pages yeah. who are serving a knight and are hoping to become a squire, become a knight. So it's, it's for little lads, you know. Their first job of the day, before their lord is up, is to prepare the privy. And he's told to make it extremely clean. He's got to sweep it out and make it clean. He's also got to put cloths in there. Not quite sure how the cloths were used, but there to go in there and sweet smelling herbs yeah. so that it's somewhere comfortable and pleasant to be so at least for those at the very top of society going to the toilet ought to have been quite a nice experience yeah I, th I think I mean it wouldn't have smelled too bad I mean I know the poo is going down and yes if it's not getting moved there might be a bit of wafting up but those herbs would certainly have taken the edge off and there is, of course, the question of toilet paper. There is. <laughs> I mean, many people think leaves and moss, but let's face it, deforestation. <laughs> Where the heck are you going to get a leaf of the right size in the middle of January? I mean, honestly. And then you also you think, well, moss, but you'd, you'd have to have moss plantations, yeah. wouldn't you, to keep yeah. a big community it, going? It gets very, very dry in summer. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, there's nothing to say that people didn't use. I mean, you know as well as I do that archaeologically all sorts of things turn up in cesspits. Yeah, yeah. So, probably people used whatever was to hand. But I do wonder if maybe the more normal system, especially in a castle, would have been to have your own cloth or rag or flannel to wash or yourself with. Or even a communal rag. Quite possibly. Or washed out in a bucket. Washed out in a bucket. It, it's perfectly possible. For these privies, that well, certainly is a coat of render, coat of lime wash. Probably a loose seat. I think a door might be a good idea too. And a door. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to take some, uh, this thing is uh, grease, is dripping. Uh, you have to take it on your finger like this. And that's for a cake. You put it inside. <laughs> Just work that around. And that's to actually lubricate the side of the template, is it? Yes. So the tile will come out easily at the end. So uh, I like to, to start with hand because you, we can feel, you can feel all the corners. It's very important to have good corners in a tile. If not, the masons are really not satisfied <laughs> to work. It's very hard for them. We don't upset the masons. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you can use this as well. Right. When you think the corners are okay, you can just finish with Right, so but you're not just hitting it, are you? Sort of looks like you're rolling a bit there. Yeah, a little bit. If you like do it like this. Right, okay. You see. So, okay. It's almost like it's you're nuts. twisting it off as you make contact. That's what's happening with you. With me, it's kind of in between, I think. New tool. New tool. You use this one like this. And try to get something very flat. So we have to, to see if it's okay on the other side. When there's a problem, it's always with the corners, always something with the corners. Okay, so so we up. have to check the corners. Okay, my corners are good. What do you think? This is perfect. Oh, yeah? <laughs> very good. Yes, yes. Masons will be happy. Okay, you put it there and you do like this. With the grease poke, normally it's green. But you have to sign with the name of this place. And basically, that's like quality control. Yes. And if we've done once, we've got another 69 to do. Yes. <laughs> <We're about> to <laughs> Just beyond the castle walls, Ruth is visiting Gedelon's paint house to discover how the ochre found in the quarry and in the clay is used to make pigments for paint. I'm going to start by grinding down the earths. Valérie Urteau is a ceramicist by trade from a family of local potters. She's in charge of pigments, paint making and decoration at Gedelon. Oh, so these are the pieces that 
Tom was finding in amongst the clay when he was doing the tiling. Donc on ne sait pas la couleur de la pierre, la couleur qu'il y a dans la pierre, on ne la connaît pas. Paint's funny stuff. It's, it's not the same as dye. Dye stains the fibres of what you're dyeing. So, so if you get a, a wood stain, that is a dye for wood, um, because it, it, it's dyeing the wood fibres in the same way as cloth is a dye that stains the fibres. Paint is different. Paint is bits of coloured stuff that are glued onto a surface. And so, if they're very big lumps, the amount of light coming off is quite small, the colour looks patchy and thin. If you can make the particles very, very tiny, the light will refract off them in a great burst and you'll get a really strong, intense colour. I mean, I shouldn't think a 13th century person thought about light refraction, but they did know that if you grind it thoroughly, you get a much better paint. It's not a bad colour, is it? <laughs> Look good against the yellow. I've got the yellow still on there. Yellow ochre is the other key colour found in the natural Guédelon environment. <laughs> this really is the colour of Guédelon, oui. look at that. When you're around here, everything's this colour, absolutely everything. That is the dust that we breathe in whenever you go anywhere near the castle. It's what grinds underfoot, it's the, you know, just look at the place. This is the colour of the ground. So having sort of crushed it up a bit and dissolved it, we're now sieving it. We want small particles. As the mixture settles, the heavier ochre particles fall to the bottom, and the remaining liquid is left out in the sun to dry. The finer particles left behind are then ground down into a powder. It's an enormous amount of work to grind this down to the fineness that you need, but when you just see the range of colours that have been produced just out of the earth of Gadalon, you can see why people would bother. Just look at it. Out in the castle courtyard, Peter and Philippe Delage, known to his fellow craftspeople as Gandalf, are mixing uh, lime wash made with one part lime and one part water. It, what is that in French, lime wash? Is it is... lait de chou? Lait de chou? Yeah. Oh, milk, milk of lime. That, how can you tell it's good consistency? Oh. There's more on the Oh, top. it's really good. Is that that's good? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Oh, it should be enough. Yeah. I'll grab that bucket. Yes. Come on. Yeah. <sighs> Up the towel. Peter heads towards the Lord and Lady's bedchamber in the Great Tower to brighten things up in the Gardaog. Right, left, English, French, a blush, a gauche. And then it's down, down, down. And it just gives a beautiful beautiful texture. I know at Gedlon there was a massive debate as to whether, you know, they should leave the stones, the walls bare, because all this work had gone in by the masons to, to put the stone there, and they say if you cover it up with mortar, if, with render and paint it with lime wash, the public won't see it. But this is how the castles were in the medieval age. Of course, as we come across castles, they're ruins generally. Very little plaster work survives. Ruth and Valerie experiment with a bit of 13th century chemistry. So this is the local yellow ochre earth. Oui. Oui. And we're cooking it parce qu'il va devenir rouge. So we're trying to turn it red. Oui. <laughs> it's quite exciting, isn't it, that this just comes out of the ground all yellow. And you can get this range of colors. Là, il est déjà 
Il est déjà en train de changer de couleur oh, yes. sur le bord. Oui, yes, you're right. I can see there where it's hot. Look at the difference on my fingers. Yellow ochre is a hydrated iron oxide, known as limonite. As it heated over the fire, some of the limonite turned into hematite, turning the ochre into rich, darker shades, such as burnt sienna and burnt umber. Pigments like this are really ancient. Right across Europe, if you think of those cave paintings right at the dawn of human history, this is the sort of paint that they were using to make them. And if you think of Britain, the Picts, think those people are known or described in the ancient Roman texts as being covered in red paint, the red men, and the Irish talk about it too. It seems to have been a really Celtic thing to do, to paint yourself with red and yellow ochres. I'm more orange. Oh, look at that. Just beyond the castle walls at Gedelo, the earthen kiln used for the firing of tiles is lined with bricks. Kilns were often owned by the local lord, who of course charged his tenants for using them. In the 13th century, regulations governing the work of local tilers in and around Toulouse specified not only the consistency and dimensions of the tiles themselves, but also the size of the kilns used and the number of tiles permitted to be fired in any one firing. Gedelon fires 4,000 tiles at a time. Bruno Favau is the chief tile maker at Gedelon, and he and his team have presided over 15 experimental firings during the past nine years. Each firing has enabled them to improve and finesse their techniques. The way they're placing them in the kiln, they're leaving gaps so that when they fire this, the flames can work their way up through every single tile and hopefully you'll be in even temperature, making each one hard, each one a very similar colour and, and, and making sure there's no losses. Um, and one of the problems with these tiles, when you dry them out, if there's any water in there and you fire it too quickly, the kiln, that water will expand because it'll turn into a gas. It'll blow the tile apart. You'll hear a pop. And if these are stacked incorrectly, if one tile goes, several tiles could go. They've been doing this for a number of years. They know what they're doing. It's, a lot of this is trial and error. Uh, experimental archaeology. They, they, they know what these kilns look like from excavations that have been done in the UK, that have been done in France. Now they know how these kilns actually work because they've been working these kilns. Out in the peace and quiet of the forest, Ruth is making an essential tool for applying her medieval paint. So if I'm actually going to be able to paint anything that looks like something, I'm going to need a decent brush to do it with. So I went and found some badger hair. Well, I'll be honest, there was, a, there was some roadkill, so I shaved it. Um, I know it sounds a bit of a weird thing to do. <laughs> So, I shaved it as close to the skin as I possibly could in order to keep the hairs all as they grow naturally in order. So when I sort of grab a little tuft of it here, if I sort of try and separate a bit out. And what I want are these long straight hairs that are what helps a badger shed water. The hair is designed to move water, which is why it makes such great brushes. I'm going to glue those hairs in place so they don't move during the next bit of the process. The glue Ruth is using is gum arabic, hardened sap from the acacia tree, mixed with four parts water. Gum arabic, of course, is water soluble, so I'll be able to just wash it out of the brush at the end. And can you see how that's coming together now as a point? That's exactly what I want it to do as a finished brush. 
If you look at a modern paintbrush, there's a sort of metal bit between the hairs and the stick. The 13th century, you're not, not going to mess around trying to make a metal ferrule. You just do something much, much easier and cheaper. You go and get yourself a feather. Because if you think about it, if I cut that bit off and I cut that bit off, I've got a ready-made tube. I can take a little bit of thread and bind my hairs. Just whipping them into place. As tight as I can manage. And I've got a nice, firmly held little paintbrush head, which I should be able to poke through. There we go, and you can see how firmly that's in there now. See? Paintbrush head. All I need now is jam a stick in the other end. Done. That looks like it'll work, doesn't it? The pressure's on at the tile kiln. The 13th of May in medieval France was regarded as the day of the holy ice. It was believed to be the last day of spring in which a hailstorm would occur, sent by God as a sign of his omnipotence before the arrival of summer. And as hail often turns quickly to heavy rain, that could have disastrous consequences for the fate of this batch of tiles. This firing has already been held up for several days, owing to heavy storms. And once again, dark clouds are looming overhead. The rain is coming, and we've just got to get this finished, because if these tiles get wet, it'll be a serious problem. Not only can it affect their ability to fire, essentially, that they may explode if if the water gets in there. It also take an awful lot more fuel to dry this kiln out and then get it up to temperature. Medieval tile makers would probably have used mud, earth or wooden boards to weatherproof the tops of their kilns. But for reasons of practicality and efficiency, Gedelon relies on sheets of 21st century corrugated iron. There isn't a moment to lose. Here it comes, the holy ice. The hail. The last time of the year you'll get hail. And almost as if on cue. As feared, the hail quickly turns into a downpour. The kiln will remain covered for several days to allow the soil around it and the wood required for firing time to thoroughly dry out. Only once Bruno has assessed that the ground and climate conditions are optimum will the firing finally take place. Good work, Peter, good work. And at this rate, it may have to be postponed for several more days yet. Glad I've got a poncho, Tomo. While the tile firing is on hold, progress is made on the chapel tower. The guard room within the lower floor is undergoing a colourful transformation. <laughs> Valerie and her colleague Aurélie Payard are using the Gedelon ochre to paint a design on the walls known as fictive masonry. This was a popular style of artwork among the nobility and royalty throughout Europe in the mid-13th century. It was a less expensive way to create the illusion of the walls having been constructed from expensive white limestone. By lime washing the cheaper sandstone white and then overpainting this with a colorful fake stonework pattern, a look of grandeur and of wealth was created. Transformation of this room is incredible, isn't it? Yeah, to think it goes from bare stone to render to lime wash to this. I mean, this is prestige, isn't it? In 1240, the Queen of England had something very similar in her bedchambers with the addition of flowers. But you know, 
brightens the room, doesn't it? It's like visual, it's yeah. impressive. Yeah. And these fake joints made out of this ochre paint give the impression of highly cut stone. Exactly. <laughs> it's like you are replicating what's beneath it, but in a very stylish way. In a way that actually says to people coming here to visit, this is what I'm worth, I've got money, I can make this happen. The ochre pigments would be mixed with a glue binder made from egg, or sometimes rabbit skin to make the paint. I'm not sure if my lines are dark enough. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. I think I top loaded my brush a little bit too much there. <laughs> it, ha it hasn't run. That's the danger, isn't it? Too much pigment on your, your brush. Yeah, do you want to touch up that bit there and then I'll nip in there? No, it's all going wrong. It's going wrong. It's looking awful. It is. Yeah. Well, I've seen worse. Well, I know, but you know, you should put yourself down. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh. Every aspect of Gedelon's design is planned by a scientific committee of experts. They work closely with the staff so that every feature is based on authentic primary sources of historical evidence. And just a few miles away, in the village of Moutier, is a key example of that evidence. The Church of St. Peter, built around the year 1000, the Church of the Middle Ages was a huge and wealthy landowner, which exerted a powerful influence over people's lives. And the interiors of its buildings often set a benchmark for the tastes and trends of the era. In the early 1980s, the white distemper covering the interior walls started to crack and peel. This is amazing. Uncovering a fascinating medieval secret. They're everywhere. A painstaking conservation over the next 10 years revealed these stunning ochre murals from the 13th century. They've provided Gedelon with an authentic and illuminating resource from which to draw inspiration for the interior decor of the castle. This is the panel that we're particularly interested in in terms of the work we're doing at Gedlin. Right. Yeah. It's amazing, you can, you can pick out there, you can see the frieze. Yeah. And these five petal flowers, you find these all over the place. Very pop art, <laughs> but it's pure 13th century. Of course, the church would have been absolutely central in people's lives. Mm. Everyone locally would have had to have come to this church. So the paintings on these walls aren't just decoration. They are here to tell stories. They can be read very much like a cartoon strip. Right. It's almost the entertainment of the age. The biblical story is just laid out in scenes. And I like the way that the artists have also taken uh, the opportunity to retell the story uh, in their way. If there was any kind of friction <laughs> between them and the church, look, we've got Eve here yeah. sashaying away, being very cheeky, yeah. giving the wink to Adam, just yeah. behind here. They have a, a wink. We can't see what happens behind the pillar. And then afterwards, they've got a harvest and a child. So I wonder what the reaction was, because presumably the villagers would be in on the joke. Only when you. Ruth is applying some of the techniques discovered at the Church of St. Peter to the bedchamber, which would have been used to provide hospitality to the Lord and Lady's most distinguished guests. It's the most highly decorated room in the castle so far, and Ruth is using the burnt red ochre paint to restore the rose motifs in the window seat. 
obviously the domestic spaces within a castle are intended to impress. They have to look gorgeous. It's about the look of the place as much as anything else. And naturally, people painted their walls. It's not a church. This isn't about religious storytelling. This was about showing your power. It was about prestige. That up there, that little bit where it's painted to look as if it's masonry, with the little roses in front, often called stones and roses, is perhaps the most typical, as far as we can tell, of all interior decorating designs of the mid-13th century. That is what the Queen of England had on her bedroom walls in the Tower of London. Stones and roses, the very height of fashion. Back at the Church of St. Peter in Moutier, Sarah explains how the paintings on these walls have informed the way in which Gedelon's interiors are decorated. Because we don't have a lot of evidence of the types of paintings that were inside castles, right. uh, we, we were always very careful to say to people, okay, we don't know if there was ever a bedroom painted in exactly the style that we've got at the castle, yeah. Yeah. but just a stone's throw from the, the castle, castle. At the same time, yeah. we're painting these same patterns, and crucially, it's the same colour palette. This is just like walking out of the yeah. quarry, isn't it? We've got the red ochre, the, the yellow ochres, the browns. I have to say, I mean, you look at the masons when they come out of the quarry and that kind of... the dust and the ochre that's on them, that's that is your colour palette. Absolutely. No, it's, everything's there. So if we wanted to paint in this area it, with blues or greens, yeah. we'd have to buy those pigments in from further afield and they would have been more costly. Yeah. And it's interesting to see that in a church, the decision has obviously been taken not to have too much blue or green. They've used the materials that were available locally. Artwork like this just doesn't really survive in castles. Castles are generally ruins, but churches are such a, an important historical reference. No, that was, a, that was a, certainly a, a challenge for us, and that we were aware that there are very few models of the types of paintings yeah. that there would have been inside castles at this time. It was a very deliberate decision not to use the human figures, right. because obviously these are depicting uh, biblical stories. Yeah. Uh, so we, we stuck very much with the, the flowers, the trees, the geometric shapes. But what we, we're wanting to do is offer people a vision of what a 13th century visitor might have seen and to yeah. get over the fact that the castles weren't bare stone, empty yeah. places. They were decorated and they were full of colour. Another area of the castle, which is the result of intense research into 13th century architecture, is the chapel. Clement Girard, the chief stone carver at Guédelon, is a highly experienced draftsman, but he's about to undertake his most ambitious project to date. Right now, Clement's doing the drawing for what will be the prestige feature of the chapel. So much so, they've actually imported a slightly less hard type of limestone that will be easier to carve. This really is precise work. I am marvelling at the skill he's got. Clement is designing a decorative piece of masonry based on a very common 13th century design found throughout France. It's a niche for the chapel wall, with a trefoil-shaped head, which will sit upon pillars rising from two small basins called piscines. At Gedelon, white-dressed limestone is used for the more decorative features of the castle. Although it's quicker to dress than the quarry's hard sandstone, 
it's easier to chip, so great precision is required, and mistakes could prove costly. Finally, it's the morning of the long-awaited firing of the kiln. Peter's up early to help share the workload with Florian Dubois. The firebox in the lower chamber has been stacked with logs and twigs. And at last, the first piece of kindling is lit. Within seconds, clouds of wood smoke are billowing out at the top of the firing chamber. It's going to take hundreds of armfuls of wood and many hours of careful monitoring to turn these flames into the roaring blaze required to fire the tiles. A long, hot and exhausting day lies ahead. The stone carvers have completed the first part of the white limestone niche and are ready to transport it to the chapel tower. The hoisting of the stone requires care and attention. The Lord and all of those working for him would have set great store by this sacred work of art. For us, the significance is that this is the first real piece of religious architecture that we've got in the castle. Uh, this is the, the only sacred space within the castle. So we're actually standing here in the area where the altar will be. So this is the holiest place right. of this, this sacred space. Where you'd have the holy water and the yeah. oils, yeah. So the, this is the most delicate sculpture that we've done here. As you can see, it's a hand basin. You, you've seen yeah. it being, being dressed earlier. Yeah. But you can see the two dips. Now, we had some priests visiting. We were wondering ourselves why there were these two kind of recesses. And the priests that were visiting suggested that maybe one was for, for washing the priest's hands before the Mass, and that the other one was then for washing the implements that had been used in the Mass. Right. What we've been told, at least, yeah. is that the idea is that all the water that is in uh, this, this piscina, this, this hand basin, is holy water yeah. and as such it can't just be thrown away yeah. uh, all the water will actually and we're not talking about huge amounts but the water will just kind of filter down into the wall and stay within the walls of so the chapel. Be, the, the, the stone of the chapel itself is obviously porous it's going to absorb that yeah. holy water yeah. and essentially make this whole space even more sacred that's the idea so our mini little temple here at Guédelon. Uh, so it's been an opportunity, obviously, for the stonemasons to, to use different techniques. Yeah. And then there was a little bit of improvisation that, that gave the, the stonemasons an opportunity to, to kind of have a bit of freedom of movement. You can see yeah. each column is slightly different. different. This is Mathieu's. You can see his mark up here on the stone. And on the other side, we've got Jean-Paul's right here. The mason's marks on dressed stones are a permanent reminder of the ancient skills and techniques of the medieval masons. Each one presents us with a unique signature of the craftsman who carved a particular piece. is rising. A month's rain has taken its toll, and the firing is not going to plan. Everything got wet. The kiln got wet, the wood got wet. So it's just taking that a little bit longer to dry everything out, get rid of the moisture. The blaze is still several hundred degrees below what it needs to be. 
Peter leads a frantic effort to try to save the 4,000 tiles inside. We know today the optimum temperature for successful firing is around 1,000 degrees centigrade. 13th century tilers relied on their experience, their senses, and costly trial and error. They would have been under intense pressure to get firings right. The kiln, it's just about getting up to temperature now. It's ready to really feed up, and it's pretty soon those tiles will be getting close to firing, but it does mean it's gonna be a longer day. I mean, the sun is setting in the sky. We're gonna go late into the night. A tiler's trade depended on the local nobility's trust and the reliability of his product. And the strict laws governing the standards of production were rigidly enforced. Tiles must be correctly stacked. The temperature must not be too high or too low. The heat must be distributed evenly throughout the kiln. If not, the results could be underfired, overfired, or otherwise damaged tiles. And the medieval lord would neither accept nor pay for a single substandard tile. Failed firing had serious consequences for a tiler's livelihood. As darkness falls, Peter and the team finally succeed in getting the temperature up to 1,000 degrees centigrade. We've been working since this morning without stopping, and uh, now we are a bit tired. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was hard, but uh, now it's at a good temperature. Right. And what sort of, what sort of colors are you looking for? In it must stay orange. orange. If it's white, it's too much. If he, if he wants the, the ties to be fired evenly, right. we must stay at this temperature during two hours. All oh, right, uh, OK. But are you happy, Sibyl? Yes. Yeah? Yes, we are. Yes. It's a dream. Can you imagine living in a world with no electric lights? I mean, tonight, we have the stars, we have the moon, and we have the tile kiln. 4,000 tiles. They're just about to block this up with wood, and they're going to seal it in. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface, because this is industry. Could you imagine what it must have been like to see a castle being built of stone, surrounded by these kilns that were firing flames into that night sky. But sat back here, thinking about perhaps the hell down there, and the heavens up there, and your tiles currently in purgatory. Which way are they gonna go? Have you been good? Will they be used in that castle? Who knows? It takes several days for the kiln to cool down. Peter's helping to unload the tiles and examine the results. Même seulement en les, regarde, en les frottant, il n'y a pas de souci. Ouais. Tac. 
Ça, c'est beau. You can hear this? Yeah. It's I can hear really that. like this sound is perfect for us. That ringing sound is what you're looking for. Hey, perfect sound. Ah. Oh. It's, it's a good sound. It's um. Why are you guys spitting on the tiles? Oh, um, to see <laughs> to see if it's cooked. Because sometimes the sound is not enough. Right. We, we, the sound can be at the middle. We don't know if it's raw, cooked. So we can spit on it. And if the saliva stays there, it's cooked. If it's going inside, inside, it's, it's not. Every single tile coming out of this kiln, you're quality controlling yes. them. You're listening to the sound. Yes. If you're unsure, you spit on it. If it goes in, yeah. Yeah, we can't spit on everyone, 4,000. We don't have oh. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, what, what happens if they, if they overcook? Um, oh, we have an example. So it was not for this firing. It was for one before. Yeah. When overcooked, it's going like that. So we have this bubble of gas inside, and the bubble is, big, is growing bigger. And uh, the tire will burst with time. This is good quality. Handmade. <laughs> well, I, I, I saw how hard you guys worked and how long it takes to make these tiles. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. I'm pleased. I'm, you know, I'm happy for you. you know? <laughs> We're happy too. Yeah, we, especially with this firing, we're really happy. Yes, we have very good results. It's really nice to have it. The fired tiles are now used to floor the fully rendered and lime-washed quarry tower. It will take thousands more tiles and several more years of rendering, lime washing and painting before the entire castle finally looks like it might have done in the 13th century. starting to look like a finished castle, isn't it? You know, with the tiles and the walls all plastered and painted. It's starting to get that feel of a living space. I'll be honest, I did not appreciate how much work and effort it would take to get this stage actually happening. You know, clay for the tiles, finding the paints. But when you see it, it's unbelievable. And I really can't wait. I know it's a long time in the future yet, but for the furniture and the furnishings, yeah. for the textiles to finally arrive. Well, it emphasises that it's actually a living space and not just a defensive building, doesn't it? In moments like this, you look at this, you know, yes, I could actually sit here and relax. Yeah. It's not all about yeah. warfare when it comes to castles. Yeah. This is an entertaining space. Next to the Great Hall, you, you can bring your more select guests in here to wine them and dine them, and perhaps a guest bed in here, and, and everybody else sleeping around on mats. You can get the feel for that sort of convivial way of life. I have to say, though, the medieval period is far more colourful than I thought it was. Next time, the community of skills it takes to build a castle. From the blacksmith transforming metal to the never-ending need for wood. Plus, making a medieval water mill. Wow, is all I can say.